everyone. Uh, I have just a couple of housekeeping things to go over while we're waiting for some of your colleagues to join us. Um, my name is Joni Napier, and I'm the program administrator with Mental Health America of Kentucky. So I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, this session is part of a statewide learning series designed to increase workforce capacity to address early serious mental illness and first episode psychosis. This virtual series is made possible by BSCA funds through the, through the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental, and Intellectual Disabilities. Today's session will be held from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and your attendance is going to be tracked. Please make sure that your full name is being used as your display name, and if it's not, you can click the three little dots in your little square and click rename to change that. CEUs are not being directly offered through us, but our team is happy to help assist you if you're interested in self-submitting for those. Please note that certificates of attendance are only available to those who have attended for 50 five zero minutes of each instructional hour, and we'll also allow five minutes of wiggle room in there because we know that life happens. Uh, as you may have heard, this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be shared via our YouTube channel, and please make sure that you are muted, and please put any questions in the chat box and we'll get those answered. Today's webinar is titled Racial Trauma and First Episode Psychosis and is going to be being led by Dr. Stephen Niffley, Jr. Dr. Niffley is a racial trauma expert, researcher, author, and a board-certified psychologist in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Dr. Niffley is the Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, as well as an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience. And we are so excited to have him here today to share his knowledge with us. And with that, Dr. Niffley, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm grateful uh, that you all are here uh, and to share the space with you today. Um, I will uh, now share my presentation uh, so you all can uh, follow along with me. Go right away here. Uh, so, as was mentioned before, uh, I just need to be to. Uh, uh, share this presentation with you as we talk about racial trauma in first episode uh, psychosis. So uh, a little bit of introduction is already uh, kind of an offer at this point. Uh, just very grateful for that. Every time um, uh, someone introduces me, I'm always like, who's that guy? Uh, and so I'm just always grateful to be here. Uh, so as was noted before, I'm a now senior associate dean at the University of, College, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, as well as an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Additionally, I'm uh, the founder of Niffley Racial Trauma Therapy, uh, which I'll share with you a little bit here towards the end of our presentation. Um, from an educational background, I uh, hold a doctorate and a master's degree in clinical psychology, as well as a master's in public administration from Rice uh, State University. Uh, I'm also a proud graduate of the University of Liverpool, and I'm currently working on my MBA uh, here at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I never start any presentation without first paying honor to those folks that have paved the way for me to be here today. And so uh, to your right there is a picture of myself uh, with my papa. Um, I'm around one years old or so in that picture. Um, and uh, it's upon the sh his shoulders uh, and the shoulders of my other ancestors that I stand upon, uh, because it, if it wasn't for them, uh, I wouldn't be here uh, offering this information to you today. Additionally, um, I used to say that I do this work uh, because of some ambiguous black or brown person that's out there that is struggling with mental health issues uh, that we are attempting to support. Uh, but at this point, I do this for kind of more selfish reasons. I have my own son now. Uh, he's five. Uh, his name is Jay. And uh, it is important to me that this world is a little bit different for him uh, than the one that I grew up in. So um, I, I do this work for my ancestors, 
And I also do this word for my son as well. So I mentioned in my kid, um, uh, he is such a great kid. Uh, I love him so much. Uh, in my unbiased child psychologist opinion, uh, he is the best kid ever. Uh, however, he costs so much money. Uh, kids are so expensive. And so I'm going to take a second to hustle a couple of books uh, in hopes that you will make a donation to Jay's Empty Pockets Foundation um, and support him, uh, his financial needs. Um, so I've written six books at this point, uh, two books that might be of interest to you. Uh, one is on Black males in the criminal justice system, uh, which helps us to understand the experience of Black males from arrest to reentry. Uh, the other text is on Black males' uh, identity, Black masculinity, and its intersection with uh, mental health and treatment. Uh, I've been very fortunate to conduct TED Talks on how do we have conversations with folks uh, that are different from ourselves. Uh, and uh, was recently selected as one of our top 40 and under 40 uh, in the city of Louisville. Uh, additionally here, I uh, have been recognized for the work that I do around reducing health disparities uh, for folks that uh, have experienced mental health related challenges, especially by our BIPOC individuals around the context of racial trauma. And so I've been recognized as a healthcare hero, uh, healthcare with the Healthcare and the Advocate Award, as well as the uh, 2021 uh, Diversity Leadership Award uh, from the University of Louisville. Most recently, here, I was uh, honored uh, to be inducted into the Black Psychologist uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, for the work that I do around reducing health disparities uh, and increasing access to mental health treatment around racial trauma. Uh, so grateful to be uh, up on the wall uh, with some of the most amazing psychologists of both the past, present, uh, in terms of work that we do. So uh, because we are recording, I just want to be mindful of, uh, of this, uh, but usually I start in with a, a little bit of a check-in um, we oftentimes just kind of jump into conversations around trauma, um, and I feel like it's always important for us to take a step back and to just check in to see how folks are doing. Um, and so just thinking to yourself, um, how are you doing today? Um, if no one has asked you, I'm asking you, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, what are your goals for today? And then um, kind of what have you been doing for self-care? How are you pouring into your own cup. And I want to make sure that you are thinking about those questions for yourself uh, in ways, uh, and then also thinking about or thanking you uh, for all the ways in which you're showing up today, um, despite how you're feeling, uh, despite uh, any other challenges that you're having. Uh, I'm just grateful that you are here. So I have three objectives for our time today. Uh, I will discuss a little bit about the etiology of psychosis. I'll then explore the intersection between racial trauma and psychosis, specifically with that focus on uh, first episode psychosis. Uh, and then we'll end by discussing some of the barriers uh, that folks have to accessing and navigating treatment for first episode psychosis, uh, specifically focused on BIPOC individuals. Uh, and for the nature of this presentation, We'll focus uh, on the BIPOC family, uh, given uh, what the science is telling us, uh, their important role uh, in all of these things. We'll then end by talking about uh, some recommendations that will include uh, conversations about how to involve the family, uh, as well as uh, interventions uh, utilizing our nipple racial trauma uh, therapy approach. So just as a disclaimer, uh, when it comes to our understanding of diversity, I will specifically be focused on uh, BIPOC individuals and thinking about this context of race. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that there are other factors that indeed impact uh, the experiences of, of psychosis uh, for different types of individuals. And so I want to acknowledge and, and own the limitations of this presentation uh, because of that focus. Uh, but this next slide will just kind of show that this is my understanding of what diversity looks like. And so there are 32 different ways in which someone might identify based on this kind of continuum from young to old. 
mode from a person with a disability to an able-bodied person um, in regards to gender, uh, et cetera. And so I just want to acknowledge that uh, this particular presentation uh, focuses specifically on race, racism, and BIPOC individuals. So now I just want to tell you a story, because if you talk with me long enough, uh, that is what you will hear, uh, because I found that's a, a meaningful way to explain uh, challenging concepts to folks. Also, as I mentioned before, um, my uh, grandparents are a big part of my upbringing, and uh, that's one of the things that my grandpa really loved to do was to, to tell you a story. Uh, so we'll share that as a way to center our conversation today. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about JR, uh, who uh, is a 23 year old black male. Um, he was brought to psychiatric emergency services uh, for religious delusions, uh, challenges with social isolation, insomnia, as well as increased irritability. Uh, he had presented to PES uh, with his mother and two of his close friends and was potentially struggling with a uh, first episode uh, of psychosis. So per the mother's report, uh, JR started to experience those delusions after his friend was killed uh, by police in a, a nearby town. Um, and according to JR, uh, he felt that he needed to demonstrate uh, the strength of his faith in order to be protected from law enforcement. And so really lean into this idea that um, he needed to show uh, his adherence to his faith background and his performance in his faith background uh, in a way to make sure that he wasn't killed like his friend. Uh, there were some challenging experiences with the PES staff. Uh, so uh, they um, uh, would try to bring him back into the room uh, to, to do the evaluation. And he really didn't want to go back there. He insisted that uh, his friends uh, needed to go with him. Uh, but the staff at the time felt that that was an unsafe space to have uh, these three black males um, in a, a space uh, to have this type of conversation. Uh, there was a lot of kind of fear and anxiety going on uh, because the staff was uh, unable to communicate uh, kind of like what happens during the process of an evaluation. Um, and so someone that was already pretty ag agitated was becoming more agitated in terms of JR, and they were having a hard time like, calming him down. And so through the course of the evaluation, uh, the staff determined that uh, there was no SIR or suicidal ideation, that there's no homicidal ideation. And so they, they released him uh, and didn't hospitalize him. In um, reflection, uh, some of this could have been due to concerns about the safety uh, of the staff and uh, things along those lines. Uh, but what ended up happening uh, the very next day uh, is that uh, JR actually jumped from a three-story building um, and, and shattered his, his legs pretty significantly um, because he felt like he needed to test his faith. He needed to show uh, that he believed in God and he believed that one of the ways in which he could do that was to uh, uh, walk out on faith, if you will, essentially off this building. Um, and so I'll share the story as a way to help us to kind of contextualize uh, what is the, some of the dynamics that can occur around our first episode of psychosis, uh, and then to help us to have some questions to reflect on. Uh, so what else would you want to know about JR? Uh, how would you have handled JR's confrontation with PES staff? So thinking about how you would have managed um, his ag agitation, uh, the fear and anxiety that he had experienced around, um, uh, you know, not really know, understanding the process of an evaluation, uh, wanted his, his friends back there, but the staff really not wanting them back there, uh, addressing some of the delusions that he was having. Um, and then just kind of ending here by thinking about well, what role might race have played in JR's experience uh, with the PES staff. And so as we have our conversation today, uh, just kind of keep JR in mind, keep these questions in mind, um, and then we'll attempt to answer them uh, after the content has been presented. 
So first we'll talk a little bit about uh, psychosis uh, etiology and some things for us to uh, reflect on uh, here in the space. Uh, so some of these you might already be familiar with, but these are some of the signs and symptoms uh, for us to be aware of. So suspiciousness and paranoid ideals and uneasiness with others, uh, that trouble thinking clearly and logically, there's uh, social withdrawal that can happen. There can be unusual or intense ideals, strange feelings or an absence of feelings. Sometimes there's a decline in uh, personal hygiene or self-care, uh, 